uh, on Holocaust studies. Start over? Start over? Okay. <laughs> uh, professor, welcome, Professor Albert Rabin. He's a late psychology professor at MSU who 30 years ago um, created an endowment in honor of his parents, David and Sarah, uh, to have a lecture on the Holocaust uh, each April. And we've been doing that for almost 30 years, having some of the most esteemed um, international scholars on, in Holocaust studies. And we're really honored to have uh, Michael Berkowitz with us this evening. Um, so we've done that. And then in 2013, um, Ed Brill and Leslie Van Brandt, his sister, also created an endowment in honor of their brother, Michael, uh, who was always eager to learn more about the Holocaust as well. And so we've combined these lectures since then in a Rabin Brill um, Endowed Lecture in Holocaust Studies, and we're really uh, appreciative, and uh, I know that um, Ed and uh, Leslie are with us this evening through the live stream, so we really appreciate uh, your, your um, support that allows our students and faculty and community members uh, to learn from the most prominent um, scholars that we bring to MSU. Uh, we also want to appreciate the widespread support we have across the campus. So we have support and co-sponsorship from James Madison College, the College of Arts and Letters, the Residential College of Arts and Humanities, the College of Social Science, the Department of History. There's several faculty from the Department of History with us this evening. Um, the Center for European, Russian, and Eurasian Studies, and the um, Office of Institutional Diversity and Inclusion. I also just want to point to, real quick, um, we have our next event on April 29th. It's our sixth annual undergraduate uh, research conference that the Serling Institute puts on. And we have many of our students, some of them who are with us this evening, presenting their uh, research that they did. Our faculty will be there. We'll have a complimentary lunch between 12 and 1 on side. So you're welcome to come to that as well. Um, I'm going to invite um, Professor Amy Simon to in, uh, introduce our speaker. She's the William and Audrey Farber Chair in Holocaust Studies and European Jewish History here at MSU. She teaches at James Madison College and the Department of History and is a core member of the Serling Institute. She also recently uh, was awarded the MSU Teacher Scholar Award. Um, so we're really proud of her. <laughs> and uh, please welcome and uh, you can introduce your former, one of your former mentors, I believe, <laughs> Michael Berkowitz. So thank you so much for everybody who's here. Um, I know you not only had to brave uh, the, all the COVID restrictions and masks and all of this that we've been going through uh, for two years, but also this famous late April Michigan snow. Um, so thank you for being here. Um, it is indeed a weird time. Um, and thank you everybody on the live stream as well. It's kind of the blessing and the curse. It's wonderful to all be in person. Uh, but on the other hand, we have such a amazing ability to reach so many more people on, on live stream and on Zoom. So, you know, a little bit of both. Um, so thank you all for your attention. And it is really my distinct pleasure to welcome Dr. Michael Berkowitz here to MSU. Um, I did learn today that um, I think we were the last Big Ten university that you hadn't uh, spoken at or somehow been involved with over the years, um, including getting a PhD from one of them, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, and so it's um, also a double pleasure to be able to, you know, have you here for the first time. So I will read this because um, I always miss something if I don't read, and then I'll say something personal as well. So Michael Berkowitz, a native of Rochester, New York, which will be relevant here, is a professor of modern Jewish history at University College London, UCL. He taught previously at the University of Judaism, Ohio State University, and the University of Chicago. He is author of Jews and Photography in Britain in 2015, and since 2012, editor of Jewish Historical Studies, Transactions of the Jewish Historical Society of England, also through UCL. His previous publications, and I always say this, it's remarkable to me how broad his approach to Jewish studies is, and just um, very inspiring uh, to see uh, such a wide breadth of topics expertly handled by one person. Um, so his previous publications include The Crime of My Very Existence, Nazism and the Myth of Jewish Criminality in 2007, The Jewish Self-Image, 2000, Western Jewry and the Zionist Project, 1997, Zionist Culture and West European Jewry Before the, World, Before the First World War, 1993, 
and 97, and we are here, New Approaches to Jewish Displaced Persons in Post-War Germany, co-edited with another wonderful colleague of ours, Avi Noam Pat, in 2010. He is currently preparing a book, Washington's, in parentheses, I don't have a, 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 a hand signal for it, Nearly Secret Hollywood Connection for the University of Pennsylvania Press about American Jews and movie making during the Second World War and he has held fellowships in the last few years all over, including the Remark Institute of New York University, the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum in Washington, D.C., Yad Vashem in Jerusalem, and he is currently a Kane Senior Fellow at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia. And I should say, uh, because it's also, uh, I feel like his personal biography is part and parcel of who he is as a scholar, he is also a graduate of Hobart College, and a PhD from University of Wisconsin-Madison. And as Yael alluded to, um, he uh, was the director of the Holocaust Studies program when I completed my master's degree in Holocaust Studies at UCL. I think it was 2003 that the degree was awarded or four. In any case, a long time ago. And, um, and he was instrumental in helping me uh, figure out uh, the whole graduate program, uh, PhD application process, in instructing me uh, on the better programs and the people that I should work with, and ultimately um, helping me realize that Indiana University was actually an amazing place to go for Jewish studies, which I never would have known. I was from Texas and had no clue anything about the Midwest, and he was right. It's an amazing Jewish studies program, and I am so fortunate to have gone there for my PhD and then um, landed in another Midwestern Big Ten university. So I thank you so much, Michael, personally, and am thrilled to welcome you here today. Okay, I wish to express my warmest appreciation to Professor Amy Simon and her MSU colleagues. It's a most special honor to deliver the Rabin Brill Lecture for the Jewish Studies Program. I also wish to recall a generous, modest, quietly brilliant Michigan State colleague who some of you might have known that is a historian, William McCagg, who died nearly 30 years ago. And in many respects, I think he ran ahead of his time and he was really an exemplary colleague. Well, I'll begin with a rather abrupt fact. The Nazis annihilated and compelled the expulsion of thousands of Jewish women and men who had made their living through photography. In the Mauthausen camp alone, at least 160 Jewish victims were professional studio photographers or involved in fields such as medical or dental photography. Ultimately, the most famous among these photographer survivors was Bernard Gottfried, although there's another non-Jewish photographer from Spain who's attracted a fair amount of attention. Bernard went on to become a stalwart of Time and Newsweek, and I had the great fortune to meet and interview him. Upon entering Mauthausen, after working mainly in a photo studio in the Nazi uh, ghetto of Rodham, Bernard identified himself as a locksmith he had heard that that was one of the, the professions that was then protected by the Nazis. Another aspect of my work, which I'll only briefly mention here, concerns the sensitivity of Jewish photographers to anti-black racism along with racial anti-Semitism. Here's a portrait of singer Nina Simone by Bernard Gottfried, who he considered a close friend and maybe we could go back to it. Again, he was, says he was mesmerized by her. He talks about his relationship with Nina, Nina Simone. Oh, let me see if I can get my, oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let's see if I can get my cursor to work. Not quite working for some reason. Sorry about that. But what I, what I want to show you, maybe I'll get a chance to do it in the end, is there's also a brilliant, very little known portrait by Alfred Stieglitz of a man named Hodge Kernan, um, and I was made aware of this through a descendant of Kernan's, who's one of my colleagues at University College London. Actually, Kernan was the elevator man 
in one of, um, one of Stieglitz's buildings. Well, the memory of the Jewish immersion in nearly all things photographic in Europe was in large measure erased in the Holocaust. Oops. A reckoning with this lacuna is well underway, as is evident in the scholarship of the late David Schneer on Soviet photojournalists. Photography is also increasingly integrated into currents of visual culture in the Holocaust, such as in the splendid work of Lisa Silverman and Dan Magalo, and Doris Bergen has thoughtfully incorporated photography in her superlative third edition of her Holocaust textbook. Well, out of academia per se, our knowledge and vistas of Jews and photography are enhanced by Maya, by Maya Benton's project on the highly problematic oeuvre and personality of Roman Vishniak, to which I myself have a modest contribution, and the uh, 2013 exhibition at the Jewish Museum of Vienna called Shooting Girls. Shooting Girls revealed that the majority of quality studios in pre-Anschluss, so pre-annexation uh, Vienna, were owned and operated not just by Jews, but by Jewish women. Exhibitions and films about individual emigre photographers, sometimes extending to famed partnerships, such as that of Ringel and Pitt, that is Greta Stern and Ellen Auerbach, and those from specific origins, such as Hamburg, have been ongoing for decades. A large part of my recent book, Jews and Photography in Britain, concerns how Jewish refugees from Munich, Helmut and Walter Gernsheim, reconceived the relationship between photography and the fine arts in Britain from the, from the late 1930s to the 1960s. Well, my principal aim here is to introduce the Jewish engagement with photography before, during, and after the Holocaust, and I'm especially interested in the continuity and discontinuity in Jews' involvement in photography. An emphasis on labor of all stripes and desire to present photography itself as a form of dignified labor is a prominent thread. And here I'll give you just a couple of examples. Sometimes these styles are identified with August Sander and others, but these are uh, just a few from my research. This is actually one from the Covno Ghetto by George Kadish. I do not believe that all ghetto photography by Jewish photographers should simply be discounted as Nazi, photogra Nazi photography. It is really a very, very complicated collection of photographs that we have and say the number of them from the Lodz ghetto alone numbers in the, uh, um, numbers in the tens of thousands. This is, I've got to say, one of my favorites of um, a Jewish carpenter who got a very good gig, that is, of carving a cross. My own grandfather started out as a dairy farmer and became a carpenter, and boy, would he have loved an assignment like that to, uh, um, to make that kind of, uh, um, to make that kind of object. And now we have some shoemakers. These are, uh, um, these, again, a group of shoemakers, again, along the lines of this theme of labor. And the last, which I'll talk about just um, a little bit more, is actually, we could, again, we could call it a Nazi photograph, but clearly it's something that was done most likely in a photography studio that had been owned by Jews. But these are people supposedly undergoing some kind of vocational training in photography in Nazi Vienna in 1940, that is, uh, these people were involved in what was called a photo course. Well, there also was, it was a well-established martial tradition of photography, of photographing soldiers, which probably might have been obscured because of the myth of the Jewish rejection of the military or resistance to it that is except for Zionism. And I can give you many, many other images like this 
which actually account for a great deal of what we see in the archives. So Jews had long maintained a special and intensive relationship with photography, but for a number of reasons that has largely been either, it's, it's either been ignored or else taken for granted. My most recent research at the Science History Institute in Philadelphia has already yielded a disturbing insight. Just in this past week, I learned how the vital role of Jews in creating color photography came to be devalued and minimized. In extolling the importance of AGFA color in 1946, former Nazi scientists actually overturned the earlier verdict, even clearly articulated in the early Nazi years, that the most revolutionary development ever in color photography had been Kodachrome, which was invented by the Jewish musicians Leopold Manis and Leopold Godowski Jr. So again, this is from the, um, the Leica color book and a Kodachrome figure that appeared. Again, this is during Nazi times in 1938. Again, this is Manis and Godowski themselves, and this is what um, a lot of my um, what a lot of my work is on. And this, I just I, I had to throw this in. That is Walter Benjamin, who's a person who's almost always quoted when anything is said about photography, um, who wrote about the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction. This is actually a wonderful Kodachrome portrait, which often is reproduced in black and white, which was done by Giselle or, um, or Giza Lafroy. Well, please allow me to be as clear as possible from the outset about my approach. My purpose here is not to investigate Nazi photography. I'm also not chiefly interested in revealing or interrogating photographs of Jews from the perspective of representations, and I'm especially averse to detailing photography's role in the intentional dehumanization of Jewry. There will be only a few of these near the close in the context of exploring Jewish photographers who helped to expose the Nazi atrocities after Hitler's defeat. I'm concerned, as I've said, with the Jewish engagement with photography in the hands-on active sense. What did Jews do themselves with photography? How did they work with it, play with it, and feel with it? I'd say mostly, though, I'm concerned with how did they make a living from it, because I think this really hasn't been uh, approached as carefully as it should be. So these are some that actually come from uh, a firm that was connected with a branch of my own family, and I'll say a little bit more about this later on. This is, uh, shows how, um, I was say, kind, I'll say it, how stupid my family was. They went from this kind of place in Lithuania to upstate New York, you know, where the weather was about as, as brutal um, as it could possibly be. And this is also something I've been very interested in that I think historians have resisted. There was photography in Nazi ghettos, which I'm going to be talking about. Well, I'm most concerned with examining photography as an important livelihood for Jews and consequences in the non-Jewish world as well. A recent part of my research has dealt with the Jewish engagement with motion pictures, that is, movie making during the Second World War, which again, I'll only very briefly allude to here. The most important person by far in a book tentatively entitled Washington's Nearly Secret Hollywood Connection is actually none other than Leo Rostin, who is known for other things. It is mainly his book, The Joys of Yiddish. He was actually a scholar of film, but he himself took photography deadly seriously. Well, by way of background, it's important to recognize that photography was unusually open to Jews beginning in the 1850s. Jews were long present and vastly overrepresented by the 1880s in nearly every aspect of the field. And again, here's some more studio portraits. Again, these come from ghettos, which are actually pretty consistent with the kind of work that had existed before. Jews were able to make it in photography in no small part 
because it was not considered the most respectable of professions. And this is an idea that I will refer to later. That is, photographers were referred to as sort of sleazy people of their time. And it was seen as not quite something that a normal person would do, as I'll be, as I'll be talking about. Jews were, though, at least in part, responsible for a significant share of innovations in the field, such as related to radiography and color photography, whether they were heralded for it or not, and they were among photography's most able practitioners. But I don't wish to dwell on sort of the old standard of Jewish contributions. Rather than speaking about this sort of staple of Jewish history, I'm more inspired by an, another one of my predecessors at the University of Wisconsin, Joan Scott, the women's historian. With regard to women's history, Scott asserts that it isn't sufficient to talk about how terrible women's lives were, or simply to list the admirable things that they've achieved, but to show how the whole of history looks different when they are integrated. And I believe that the history of photography looks different when you consider ethnic difference and say, if we look at the Ottoman Empire, if we look at the world to the east of Europe, it was Armenians who were the principal photographers, that is not Jews. So again, it not only plays itself out in terms of Jews in Europe and to a certain extent, America and elsewhere. So I believe that photography and film really look quite different when one considers ethnic difference. And here is Robert Kappa and Richard Avedon. I think it's no accident that Robert Kappa and Richard Avedon came in part from the Schmata business, that is, or families that were involved in clothing. The idea also that in addition to literature, philosophy, art, and history, knowledge and appreciation of photography is necessary in order to become a complete person or a cultured person. And it's a facet of cultural history that remains uh, really unpacked, but it finds resonance in Philip Ross Portnoy's complaint, Woody Allen's Annie Hall, Alfred Kazin's New York Jew, and Paul Auster's 4321. Well, the undergirding of my study is a very specific social history. And again, this is, uh, again, this is from Alfred Kays, and he actually, in both uh, um, A Walker in the City and New York Jew, he actually refers extensively to photography in both, both in this particular image, which often isn't understood, of actually people returning to Europe was, was, um, was really very significant for him. So again, the social historical under, undergirding of my study which is also, as you've already heard, a bit mixed with my own family history, is that in Eastern, Central, and Western Europe, Jews disproportionately founded, ran, and staffed portrait studios in cities, towns, and remote villages. They pursued all kinds of photographic work with studios as a base, and the usual answer to which I will return as to why this is so is because there wasn't anything to keep them out. That is, it's a relatively recent creation. It was a totally novel field. But this answer is more problematic than satisfactory. Jewish photographers were hired regularly and ad hoc by nearly every government desiring photographic services. And this also extended into the Holocaust. They had been prevalent among the court photographers in Europe. They often took photos to explicitly serve military aims and work expressly for the army. Even Horthy and Mussolini kept personal Jewish photographers. King Zog of Albania incredibly saved a dozen Jewish women photographers by appointing them to his court in Tirana. Earlier, Jews had been dispatched, dispatched on missions serving the aims of ethnographic research, state building, and empire. In diverse settings, Jews staffed 
dark rooms to develop photographs and were engaged in retouching and enlarging, such as Robert Kappa did in the early stage of his career. Jewish women often plied this particular trade and they were largely undervalued as retouchers. Jews were involved in scientific photography, including architecture, engineering, and x-ray technologies. As uh, Eric Mendelssohn, most famous as an architect, was also distinguished as an architectural photographer. Jews were ubiquitous as, press, as pre photo editors, press photographers, and as Annette von Finkel has detailed, photo agents the world over. But this is not a uniformly sunny tale. A great many were murdered, and a large number of them were not able, in or, or not able to reconstruct their careers. Eric Salomon was born in 1866 and murdered in Auschwitz in 1944, pioneered a candid yet intimate style reportage. He was arguably the world's most influential photojournalist that is before the Second World War. Salomon's legend was boosted by the editing brilliance of Stefan Laurent, who was a creator of Britain's Lilliput a Hungarian Jew initially in Picture Post, who was at the forefront of bringing Robert Kappa to the world's attention. Laurent is featured in a recent documentary called Picture Stories, to which I'm happy to have played a small part. Salomon, along with the leading advertising photographer of the time, Ava, or Elsa Ernestine Neulander, was murdered in a Nazi camp despite being super famous and well connected. It didn't help. Well, how was it, one may ask, that Jews flourished in photography over a continent so, so darkly implicated as unwelcoming, hostile, and eventually lethal to the Jews in their midst? They sprang up almost everywhere and moved not just from east to west, but from west to east, actually into the interior of pre-revolutionary Russia and then, of course, in the Soviet Union afterwards. Why were Jews afforded such re free reign in photography? That is, until the economic sanctions of Eastern European states in the 1920s, in the late 20s, and the rise of the Nazis in 1933, and even in the midst of the Holocaust. Well, as mentioned previously, in most communities where Jews were apart, photography was simply not the most respectable of vocations. It therefore was allowed and even in a way encouraged for more marginal types. To become a photographer was not something a normal, non-Jewish European male, a proper member of a local or national community, would usually undertake as something other than a hobby. Photography, at least until the 1940s, was seen as a possible handmaid to the vanity of the sitter and artistic pretensions of the photographer. Worse, photography spawned pornography, and it facilitated unlawful pursuits such as forgery. It was reviled as a devil's camera for early risque cinema. But we're faced with a massive paradox. Everyone wanted and treasured photographs. Photographers and handlers of photography were needed, and those among them, uh, uh, those among them who seemed talented, were rewarded. It's likely that the highest-paid category of Jewish women workers in many urban centers were photographers, especially those who ran studios. It was assumed in the Kurt Weill and Georg Kaiser opera Buffa. The czar has his, wants his photograph taken, that those seeking the best portrait would go to a Jewish woman, such as Lada Jacobi, Ellie Marcus, or Gertie Zimon. By 1900, photography was well entrenched, actually throughout the Pale of Settlement, and everywhere else Jews resided, including the far reaches of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. 
Acquiring a license as a photographer meant that a Jew was free to travel outside the pale before 1917 and establish a business in the Russian interior, including St. Petersburg and Moscow. And this is actually partly true of my own family. So even in the hinterland, photography was taken for granted, as is abundantly clear even a quick, in a quick perusal of the Yad Vashem and Washington collections. And this is, this is in some ways rather extraordinary, but kind of a typical picture. There were thousands of Jews that took photographs, many seriously prior to the Holocaust, even in art traditional and impoverished enclaves. The cost of photography, I think, has been greatly overestimated, making it seem far less accessible than it actually was. Costs were mitigated by expenses being pooled with an emphasis on groups. Hence, we have a great number of photographs of Jews in the form of postcards. Well, as we learn from photos by, say, Mano Mai of Budapest, Chaim Goldberg of Stakashuk, Chaim and, and uh, Feitzka Kaplan of Tels, K. Levin or Levinas of Yerberg, Chaim Israel Berman of Koznitz, Danon of Helm, Zoman Kaplan of Suchin, and I give you many, many others, and just uh, a few of these, and this is from the Photography Museum in, in Budapest, and this is one from Dusatos in, uh, um, in Lithuania, Zalman Kaplan in his life. Sort of a great irony. Very often the pictures of the photographers themselves aren't very good because somebody else took the picture unless they did a really good job uh, um, um, doing this remotely. But what they all really learned was that if a, if, a if a photographer was to be successful, then he, and more than occasionally she, nurtured both Jewish and non-Jewish clientele. So Jewish photographers took pictures of non-Jews, for the most part, for significant life cycle events and to mark religious occasions. They captured seminary students, priests, and nuns, this is what one finds in the archives from Jewish photographers. Normal people, soldiers, students, people who belong to Catholic societies. This is actually quite a famous, the Kazerginsky, again, famous name, uh, um, um, a, a famous name from, um, from the Vilna Ghetto. Again, very typical, this, this was the lifeblood of Jewish photographers. Uh, um, priests and nuns, weddings. And again, here we have from actually really extraordinary catalog from Lithuania, typical pictures. Here we have uh, um, somebody from the Tel's Yeshiva and a Catholic seminary student. So the, the, they photographed student groups that included Jews and non-Jews, non-religious Jewish society, non-religious non Jewish societies, uh, or at religious societies such as Catholic student organizations in places like Poland and in the Baltics, and Jewish, Jewish and non-Jewish nationalist-oriented bodies such as choral groups, sports clubs, bands, and sporting, uh, and and even shooting clubs. Again, this is a kind of thing. This is from Chaim Goldbergas. Again, also from Lithuania. National ceremonies. Again, Lithuanian national ceremonies. And this is not a Zionist picture. This is a, a, a Lithuanian nationalist picture, but taken by the Jewish photographer. Images featuring non-Jews with Jews, however, rarely penetrate Jewish-centric discourses. They are almost never shown in Jewish museums outside of, say, the, uh, 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 the famous or freaks. One of the things I found most striking in the Yad Vashem collection is the number of pictures including Jews and non-Jews which have almost never been used for any sort of illustrative purpose. Again, they just seem to sit there until I've looked at them. Again, some of them are really great and interesting photographs and we have an awful lot of them. So Jewish photographers' businesses also included Photographs of immediately deceased Gentiles and open caskets after the corpse had been embowed. 
embalmed. This is referred to in I.J. Singer's short story, not I.B. Singer, I.J. Singer, in Der Finster or in the Darkness of 1919, which draws on Singer's experience as an assistant to Alter Katzizna in Warsaw. Jews offered their services to reproduce existing photographs of deceased Gentiles, often enlarging and framing the photographs. We say sometimes in a rather gaudy or garish way. It sometimes got them the, the reputation of being something like ambulance chasers um, of their time. But because among uh, themselves, Jews did not typically photograph or show the dead, this dimension of Jewish photographers' work has been overlooked despite evidence that it was a sizable component of their trade. Oh, didn't want to jump ahead. Well, Singer also mentions, besides corpses, another category which is really fascinating. We might al almost call this a quasi-religious Jewish genre, which remained under wraps. He talks about agunot photographs. Wow. I assume that people here know what this means. It is the idea of a chained wife. And I believe that some of the photographs that we have might fit this bill. These were apparently taken in order to entice wayward husbands either to return home or to possibly behave more compassionately toward their chained wives. Well, while almost everyone everywhere who could afford a camera took family photos, Jews on professional and amateur levels photographed subjects other than family and collected photos. The archives of Yad Vashem and the Holocaust Museum have thousands of examples, countless Jewish photographs of religious leaders of every stripe, and say churches and cathedrals are all over the place. The work of Jewish photographers also, as I said, show Jews and non-Jews together, such as in voluntary fire brigades. It's actually won by a photographer named Berkovic, who actually might be, um, might be a relative of mine. Again, we have a number of these. Again, uh, very often Jews and non-Jews were mixed in these kinds of units. They incessantly, again, one other uh, a group of firefighters, well, they incessantly photograph seemingly mundane structures, such as houses, schools, shops, warehouses, fields, silos, slaughterhouses, and animal pens. And also in, in Lithuania, it's not at all surprising that they were attracted to the country's mania for aviation. That is, for some reason, aviation is just a really big thing in Lithuania. So we have airlines and where we have airplanes and pilots. So the remains of this kind of photography, which you say is the absolute vernacular, are particularly striking given the millions of photographs that were undoubtedly destroyed in the Holocaust. And I think possibly the motivation in part, particularly for the objects that we see for, um, for the places, is that in areas with frequent fires and floods, especially at a time when Jews were struggling to deal with various mis misfortunes, it was wise to have a record of things as they were. And it also might be that many Jews were interested in change or changes for better or for worse. Again, again, really very simple structures, but say for the purpose of insurance or sort of keeping track of things, this is the kind of thing that was very often done. Well, we, we may also ask, how and why did Jews initially take up photography as a vocation? And one hypothesis is that photography was attractive to Jews due to its portability, and it offered the opportunity of expansive entrepreneurship. It actually didn't take that much money to establish yourself in photography as opposed to some other fields, and there were no bars in most places to entry. For Central European Jews in the 1920s and 30s, it was often a matter of turning a hobby into a, vo a vocation when one's previous livelihood was ruined. But there are crucial factors reaching further back, and in the same way that Jews adopted instrumental roles, or sort of pressed into instrumental roles, serving the mainly Polish landowners in Eastern Europe, a function they assumed as the photography craze started in the mid-19th century was to become photographers for the Schlachta or the Polish landed gentry. The postal bank records of the village of Bizogala, for instance, show that photographer Israel Yazvoin had 400 rubles in 1907, the second largest account 
held by Jews after the miller. And there's almost nothing there in this very little uh, locale besides tiny shtetl. It's safe to assume that Israel served the one family of means that is a non-Jewish family. And I'm going to show you a couple photographs where it is, where it's marked here on the map. And uh, with all due uh, respect, this is where part of my family is from. Uh, it's a manor. It's from Baizogala, and it, there was a great archivist there who showed me around. It's, it's now a veterinary institute in Lithuania, but this is literally the middle of nowhere. The middle of nowhere. Why would there be a photographer coming out of this place? I think it's because he was most likely working for the lord of the manor. He was invited to do it. So even Jewish museums and cultural institutions have been slow to recognize how remarkable it is that we have superb photos from tiny communities which were little known and some of them are absolutely totally erased. Why do we have such great photographs from these places? Just to give you one point of comparison, I've recently read Robert Caro's great work on LBJ. The photography of the Johnsons in Texas which is even a little bit later than a lot, is really terrible. There are almost no good photographs of political groups of members of the family. Why weren't there better photographers there? Would you say, was, was Texas much more backward than, say, Lithuania, than Poland? And I think it's Jews in photography, which is actually part of the answer. So Jews as photographers being cultivated wherever there was a manor house, would help account for the preponderance of photographers in Eastern Europe, especially in the later decades of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Those who applied their trade beyond these confines spread quickly to cities such as Stockholm, Tallinn, and Helsinki. Around 1900 alone in Odessa, there were at least 97 Jewish proprietors of photography studios in Minsk. Um, uh, Mogilev and Vitebsk, up to 1911, there were 72. Their relatively high incomes allowed some to accumulate enough capital to reestablish themselves as they migrated. Records show that there were more than a few women working as photographers, and, and often, but not always, as wives and daughters. So I have found scores, maybe over 100 photographs that reveal professional quality photo studios operating in Nazi ghettos. Photographic equipment was not systematically seized in the Lodz ghetto until this November 7th, 1941. I would suggest that ghetto portraiture, rather than exemplifying defiance in the face of adversity, or, you know, I guess sometimes it's ignored because it's thought to be a simply upper class phenomenon. I don't believe that that's true either. But I think what it really shows is the attempted continuity between Jewish life before Nazism and the stage of ghettoization. In addition to the Jewish photographers uh, working under Nazi auspices, whose products I think should not automatically be dismissed as Nazi. It's very complicated. We have pictures most likely from the hand of Jews that do not fall into any of the known categories. A body of photographs from Cherbinia, which have been considered identification photos by Yad Vashem, were more likely the products of an effort to raise money for the community from abroad, as was, as was first argued by Frank Dabba Smith. I also have found a genre that has, to the best of my knowledge, received no attention at all. That is, Jews having themselves photographed in the immediate post-war period in their camp uniforms. Again, more than a few of these. Okay, I wish to share a photo. I know that Professor Simon has seen. I wish to share a photograph of my own family from Pashishvesh, Lithuania from 1909, which might be the first shot of an interior domestic scene in all of rural Lithuania. It was taken as a keepsake for my grandmother, Edith Burke Berkowitz, who had recently emigrated to the United States and married. Edith's mother, Fanny Yazvoin Burke, the woman in the white blouse in the middle, the wife of Menachem Mendel Burke, was the daughter of Wolf Yazvoin, who was for several years a court photographer to the Tsar. 
At least one of Fanny's brothers and several other family members operated photo studios and shops selling cameras, film, and photo equipment. Again, this is from uh, the middle of Kovno. The building still exists, a uh, little different shape, and this is an ad for the Osborne studio. Well, it's possible for this, it was possible for this photo to be taken of the Burks in a tiny Lithuanian shtetl because Fanny's family was in the business. Apparently, a photographer was sent from the Yasvoin's Kovno's shop with a camera. It's a reasonably good photograph. That is, it details the individual's characters in this rustic environment. I've actually been in that very room. Really quite um, incredible. It is also a Holocaust photograph. My great-grandparents, I learned only a few years ago, lived long enough to be murdered by the Nazi Einsatzgruppen in 1941. That is, uh, um, they lived in Pashishvesh, and they were killed in what the Nazis called Krakus, which Jews called Krak, which is listed explicitly in the infamous Jaeger Report. So in contrast, photographs bearing the Yasvoin imprint are now, uh, uh, now circulating, uh, 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 that are now circulating emanate mainly from the upper echelons of Russian society, including its Baltic and Northern European outposts. This is from work I did in a, an archive in Helsinki. Wolf Yasvoin also was officially at court. Um, there were probably dozens of Jewish photographers like him who maintained premises on or near the Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg. He went on to a, at least two ethnographic missions for the government, actually two, Bukhara, and I believe he was also on an ethnographic mission which was on the western coast of Canada that is beginning in the Bering Strait and then going down Canada to the United States. So Wolf and his cohort took photos too of musicians, actors, actresses, writers, and artists. And this marks the milieu of the early and later Jewish photographers. No matter the challenges facing Jews over the years, they did not fade from the Russian photography scene. Alexander Ivanov has found at least one Yasvoin photo enterprise persisted into Soviet times. And David Schneer's brilliant work on Holocaust photography in the USSR stemmed from his insight that the lion's share of Soviet photojournalists during wartime had indeed been Jews. One of my most surprising finds, which came too late for inclusion in my book, was to learn that my own great-great-grandfather has work in Britain's royal collection. Really quite incredible to me that some pictures taken by a member of my family is included in the, uh, um, in the royal collection, which in some ways is really quite amusing. Well, before a brief closing remark, I just want to say a little something about American Jews in the Second World War and photography and film. I'll just split this very quickly into two highly condensed versions of the story between the expected and the unexpected. First, I was not terribly surprised to find that there was a significant cohort of professional photographers who were Jews in the U.S. Army Signal Corps, such as David Sherman, Irving Katz, Britain's Tubby Isaacs. Similar to their Soviet counterparts, they were inclined to universalize the plight of the Jews and subsume it into larger photographs. Now, I apologize for going quickly, but I'm going to go very quickly through. Some of these photographs are horrible. And uh, I'm, th they are, but, but they served a purpose, but I want to say something else about them. Okay, again, really very different from what we often see. Here we have a Greek Orthodox wedding, Russians giving thanks for their delivery from the Nazis. All these were by Louis Weintraub, who was a photographer and really quite a macher in the trade before, during, and after the war. Here I have a mix between some um, Soviet and American photos, they're actually very similar, again, from Emmanuel Greenhouse, very talented photographer, who largely did fashion photography, but he's one of the people who helped assure that some of these photos we had from Liberation, horrible photos, actually made it out and, and were really photographs of quality. What I also found was that these Jews who had been involved in photography got them in print. 
that is they were connected to the different agencies and magazines. So down at the very bottom of this, you see Abrahams, Pool, INP, Keystone. Tubby Abrahams himself had been actually the head of the Keystone Photo Agency. This is particularly from the Pennant Camp by David Sherman, really some of those compelling photographs I'd ever seen. This is a picture he did of his buddy Robert Kappa. Again, a photo of Sherman for the US Army Signal Corps. And again, down at the bottom for Sherman, what we see is, oh, sorry, we see Sherman, Poole, Life, Keystone, these were going to major press outlets. All right, I also wanted to mention, although I'm not really gonna talk about here, Jules Buck was a very talented photographer and cinematographer who worked expressly with John Huston, and really a lot of the stuff that John Huston did in, in the war was largely a collaboration, and I really have to thank uh, um, Jules Buck's daughter, Joan Julia Buck, for letting me see her, um, letting me see her personal archive on this. Again, another scene from Dachau from Horace Tubby Abrahams. A colleague of mine in Italy has actually done the best work on the Signal Corps uh, um, photography. That is Manuel Fungesi with Daniel Allen. Talk. This was published in um, in 2015. So. They played a role, these photographers played a role in sympathetically portraying survivors from the liberated Nazi camps and swiftly seeing them into print. But my study of this group also gave way to the most unexpected turn in my research, which also, again, I think is really, really quite interesting. And, and here's how I found this. The Signal Corps photographers, who were mo um, you know, some of them quite well known, said, if they said anything, and I also shot motion picture film. And this led me to look at film that was done from the US Army Signal Corps, and I found an incredible story with Anatole Litvak as a really major figure. I'm not gonna show you the clip from this here now, but really the major figure was um, Leo Rostin, who I alluded to earlier. But a lot of this, it was held under wraps because of the accusation that somehow Roosevelt was in cahoots with the Jews, or that America was fighting the war in order to pursue Jewish interests in Europe. So there are a number of reasons why these Hollywood Jews chose to stay in the background and were very happy with giving credit to others for the kind of work that they were doing. Okay, last, I just wanna show you um, one of my most fun images here. This is from a Stéphane Laurent publication. And this says, the, the caption under the one to the left says, writer seeks material. Ernest Hemingway, famous American novelist on the Spanish front. Again, picture by Robert Kappa. And then uh, um, uh, the other picture by a photographer named Sasha Stone. Writer has material. Noel Coward, famous English playwright in his study. That is, the Jewish photographers love to make fun of Hemingway as a sort of fake tough guy. And they almost saw their own stories of how he flinched when they went after him. Or he really wasn't such a tough guy after all, but I think probably the most unflattering picture of Hemingway that ever existed. And what you have is no coward, cool, calm, collected, doing his uh, um, writing. So I've got to say, although the, the subject here was uh, um, the Haoras. This has been a really interesting subject for me in a number of ways, but one of these I says, Robert Kappa could not bring himself to take photographs of the concentration camps. He couldn't do it. He couldn't do it. So just the very last comment. The prevalence of Jews in photography has left us an unusually rich visual legacy despite the wanton destruction of European Jewry. Through examining their proactive encounter with photography, we learned that Jews played more diverse parts in the story of modernity and modernization than what we had assumed, in some ways helping to fashion visual culture overall to a far greater extent than was simply apparent to the eye. Thank you very much. Ha, 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 ha.
Hi, Michael. Thank you. Is that okay? Because there are people on Zoom, right? So they have to hear also. We're good? A little bit back, like this? Okay. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for the talk. Now, the title of your talk said, you know, lesser known perspectives on the Holocaust and photography, but many, many, maybe even most of the photographs that you actually showed us today seem to predate the Holocaust, right? The 1930s and even uh, your family photograph is from early 20th century, 1909. So I wanted to ask, my first question is, you opened by saying, you know, that the Holocaust kind of, because of the Holocaust, the um, a place of uh, Jews in the history of photography has kind of been erased, you know, that history, and you're trying to write that history. But I did want to ask, did the Holocaust then transform the significance of photography for Jews? Clearly it transformed the presence of Jews among photographs. Many of them were simply killed. Uh, but did it transform what photography means for Jews? And I'm thinking, because of the role of photography in as a form of commemoration, right, as remembering kind of visual memory, did the Holocaust transform what photo photography meant to Jews? My other question is, uh, do you think it would be interesting uh, to compare uh, the photo photographers that you work on? So the, the, the first half of the 20th century, predate before the Holocaust, is also the period of significant waves of my Jewish migration to Palestine. And I'm sure there is Jewish photography in Palestine, right? Both, or maybe not, I nope. don't know. There, there, but there is, yeah. Both of other Jews and of, you know, the, the, the indigenous Palestinians in the land and so forth. Might be interesting to compare and see kind of, even on your sociological level, did Jews earn a living in Palestine taking photographs? How did that work out? It's a very different economy, you know, in Palestine. So just kind of thinking about that comparison. Thank okay, you. well, just, just your, to your last, your last question first, um, I, there are other people that have been writing on that subject, including my wonderful colleague, Joachim Schlor, and um, others have worked on, I mean, a number of people have been working on photography in, in Palestine and Israel, so I think I'll sort of leave that, leave that to them, but one of the answers is it actually wasn't nearly as important as one would think, and it wasn't, it wasn't that great, that is, and I've actually written an article about how photography could have been much more important within Zionism and Israel, but it was sort of squandered, that they didn't do, but also part of the reason is that in Jerusalem, the leading photographers were Armenian. You know, they weren't Jews, and as I said before, in the Ottoman Empire, for the same reason why Jews were photographers in Europe, Armenians were like the leading photographers there. But, but what I would say about the significance of photography, one of the reasons why it was actually so active among Jews is because Jews did move around, and particularly with immigration, people liked sending photographs to people who had gone somewhere else. We know this about other immigrant groups as well, but, and I think that it has played a part, but I think that there hasn't been much thought given to the photographs, and when we talk about commemoration, it's been used for illustrative purposes, but with the exception of, say, my, you know, our wonderful colleague, uh, BKG, you know, in the, the Pauline Museum, not that many people have given a lot of thought to what is the history behind these photographs and can we say anything about it? And one of the questions I almost always ask is say, particularly as I was doing work, work in Lithuania, I said, please tell me if you know the names of other photographers, even if they happen not to be Jews. And very often, they c I can't, don't get an answer that the only names that come back or the only things that have marks on them are from these Jewish photographers. There are a couple places where, oh, the one there was a person and there was a major show. It does. I mean, there are certainly exceptions, but um, I think it, it, it plays. But I think it is. It, it's always been important for commemoration, but it's also been taken for granted that it exists. And why do we take it for granted? Why do we take it for granted? And I'll give you another example, another way to talk about it. I was sitting in a uh, history of photography conference, which was wonderful, and I couldn't understand most of it was in, um, it was in Rome, and a lot of it was in Italian, but over and over and over again, you heard Stieglitz, Sontag, and Benjamin. I was like a, you know, like a mantra, you know, Stieglitz, Sontag, why is it that these were the names that came up over, not that there aren't other people, you know, Bart and other, other people, but why isn't, I'd say that why don't we treat cameras like refrigerators as just a useful appliance? 
which doesn't really have a great, why, why did it become significant as it was? It's because of people like Stieglitz and Krakauer and Benjamin who saw it as a culturally significant, not simply mechanical process. So I think that there's just a lot more to be done. But the, but the thing, say, my general problem with a lot of what's written about photography is that much of it is not paid that much attention to the fact that it was a way of earning a living for most of these photographers. And it was really, really important in this way. And one of the best pieces of evidence I ever found was Lada Jacoby later in, his li in her life was being interviewed by this very earnest, I think most likely art student for a local, local paper somewhere in the States. And this person interviewing sort of sheepishly said, oh, I heard that you had taken some portraits of, you know, of Nazis or, you know, very disagreeable people. And she didn't, I don't know if she exploded. You didn't really get that sense. But she said, look, I worked in my father's photography studio. Someone came in to have their picture taken. We took their picture. That is, they were clients. And she said, it's only at the very end of my career that I could do things from a more sort of political and arty perspective. And she, and she basically said, look, you know, you don't understand the way things worked at the time. So I think this is the kind of thing, although, you know, one can go too far with it, but I think we really do have to think of this as a way that Jews made a living and as something that was a very disproportionately Jewish way of making a living in the same way that I'd say, we need so much more on the schmata business, like, like Adam Mendelssohn's fabulous book. We need 50 other really good books on the schmata business. There was nothing more important than the schmata business for Jews. Why don't we have more work on this? Because people take it for granted. They just take it for granted. They don't really tend to look at the history of it. So again, it's, it's a great question. Um, so sort of yes and no. Thank you uh, very much for a fascinating talk. So you're amongst several social historians here, I would say. Um, if we had historians of art, historians of photography, they might ask different questions. But I am really interested in the studio, the studio as a space, the studio also as a place of production where you need chemicals and um, all sorts of supplies to make photography work. Um, but I guess I'd like to fall back on a question about people. That is, to what extent do you have information uh, regarding the clientele that came to studios and their reaction to the rupture that the Holocaust inevitably caused? So that is non-Jewish clients who came to these studios, did they reflect at all on what was going on um, around them? Uh, did the studios employ non-Jewish labor as well? And did former employees reflect on that? And then I assume to take photography in the ghettos, one also needed a studio. So how was that possible given the circumstances of the ghetto? I just need a little more education on that particular topic. Thank you. Okay, uh, um, first of all, it, it's, um, it's really great questions. And I've got to say there is, it's really hard to get specific information. And there are, you know, th we have um, memoirs and, you know, there's material, say, in, in the um, Leo Beck Institute in New York. There are a number of photographers. We have their papers. And one of the more interesting things is, say, the reaction of the client, non-Jewish clientele after Kristallnacht where you do, I say for several of these photographers, there was sort of a sympathetic reaction. Even for some of them, even a sympathetic reaction among some of the Nazis, you know, who had known these people and then thinking, oh, you know, we'll help you to, we'll help you to get out. And I have a PhD student who wrote about Ernst Leitz, who's not Jewish, and the Leica company, and what Ernst Leitz did, although he was, you know, very helpful for the war effort, not doing all sorts of optical things for, for the Nazis, but he saved around 70 Jews, which is a pretty, big, um, a pretty big number. And I think this has to do in part with how much what he was doing with Leica was enmeshed with, um, with the Jewish world. But, the, but one of the points I wanna make, and I, I won't do this here because of COVID, but what I used to do, if I could take this out, is that possible? 
Oh, it's wired. All right, I won't bother. All right, what I used to do is say, go up to someone sitting and say, if you want to take a good photograph, you need to actually touch a person. You need to move their head. You need to adjust their clothing. You need to use a light meter. In some ways, although maybe not quite as intimate as a physician doing an examination, there is something very intimate about the photograph. And some people don't think anything of it. And some people are very comfortable with their photographers. And you know, photographers were accused of like looking down ladies' shirts and being able to see inside with the cameras. I mean, all sorts of sleazy things were said to be involved with. But the fact of the matter is you could not take a really good portrait without actually approaching the person and sort of doing something. And I think this is what we get, say, Kurt Vile's opera buffa, which he did with Georg Kaiser, the information, and usually we think of, oh, what is said in opera? It's all such wacky stuff. It's really good on <laughs> photography in a lot of ways about the czar, this mythical czar, wanting himself photographed as a bourgeois gentleman. And the idea is that he wants to go to this leading society photographer um, in, um, um, in Paris. So again, we don't have great amounts of information about it, but what we have is actually quite interesting. As a one of the more interesting interviews I did was with a descendant of a family that had a photographer's photography studio both before and after the Holocaust in Sosnovich. Actually, there were two major Jewish photography studios, uh, um, the Altmans and the Zorskis, and I actually know people from both families, and great story from the Zorskis. I'd say the, both families are, are terrific. Um, but he said that in Sosnovich, there was one church that really loved them and one big church that really hated them. And they even reestablished their business after the Holocaust. And they said that in the wake of the intense anti-Semitism in, you know, in the communist orbit with you know, uh, um, the Six Day War, a group of nuns from the nice church felt so bad that they brought them a cake. You know, <laughs> they thought it was so horrible that they were being so bad. And he just said, this is this really incredible. So it was very divided in that way. We don't have that many cases of, say, businesses that were reconstructed. But I will say that I'm sort of shocked that I found the amount of information that I have found and been able to put together. And I have to say, when I began this work, I thought that Britain was going to be either a footnote or a sentence, and it turned out to be a 400-page book. So, I mean, we all know how these things work themselves out, but I keep finding more and more and more and more and more complexity to the story in a number of ways. Thanks for your talk. It's fascinating, and uh, keep thinking about two things you said. One, the history of photography looks different uh, with Jews, right? But um, the archive of photographs that uh, that was created in this period that's with us, what, you know, I'm thinking, does this look different with Jews? And it kind of relates uh, for me to the respectability uh, issue that you just brought up, like uh, this sleaziness thing you mentioned, the, the, you know, and the, the Armenians and the Ottoman Empire, I can, I can see it, I get the vibe, but there's also, isn't there a prejudice against photography as documentary evidence in early photography or uh, ambivalence I, I don't know this is like history of photography 101 I mean this is also the period though when um, you showed uh, historical monuments you showed Westminster Abbey but there are these huge archives being created of, of pre-modern monuments and art and uh, I was thinking of Warburg Institute actually I don't know when the when it was constituted and the, the attempt to create encyclopedic uh, photographic archives of Western art, and whether um, somehow these uh, Jews, there's a great historical irony in that they, um, they got into the business because uh, they didn't have this uh, uh, prestige as documentary evidence, and their photographs like, w that were left created essentially what's understood to be a documentary archive of, of, of like high culture, and uh, I don't know if Barber, with your British angle too, um, but it's also the great period of that, that creation of that documentary archive, and I wonder if Jews have a part to play in that then. 
Okay, th th that's a great question. I will say, I, okay, um, shameless self-promotion. There's a really big chapter in my book on Jews and photography in Britain on the Warburg Institute, on the practice of photography at the Warburg Institute, in which Helmut and Walter Gernsheim play a huge part, which has had very little mention up till very recently in the uh, um, in the historiography. But but the the main part of the story here is that. It was really only when Britain was at war and basically being bombed in the Blitz that this effort started to photograph the architectural and artistic treasures of the country because of the fear of the stuff being destroyed and not having a record of it. And if they were to rebuild, what they would have to do. So this National Buildings Record Project, which the Warburg was very involved in, was absolutely important. And interestingly, there was something very similar in Germany that is as Germany was being bombed, that is Hitler himself and other Nazis thought it was really important to have a photographic record. And this is actually part of the reason why I know that the color photography in Germany at the time was not very good because of how upset the Nazis were about the poor quality of the color photography that was coming out. So these guys, the stuff I just read in Philadelphia about AGFA actually being the cutting edge and basically sort of stealing what Kodachrome had done, wow, that does not match what was going on with the Nazis and color photography. Also, I had as my chief informant for this book, uh, The Crime of My Very Existence, a wonderful survivor of Birkenau named Zippy Titschauer. And there's a whole book on her um, edited by a couple of colleagues. And she was actually the person who was most responsible for getting a friend of hers sort of hired by Mengele to do watercolor portraits, particularly of gypsies in the camp. And the main motivation, I've got to say, I talked in great depth with Sippy about this, who really knew photography, and brilliant, wonderful woman. And she said, the reason was, was because Mengele thought the color photography was lousy, and it was not matching the actual skin tones. So he thought that he had to use someone who was talented as a watercolorist in order to, but with the say, this photo I showed you of Kodachrome, was way ahead of Agfa. And I've got to say, I have arguments with people all the time who try and tell me that it's Agfa color. Well, actually, Kodak sued Agfa and most of these other photographic companies for impinging on Kodachrome. So this is like two really hard pieces of evidence which sort of show that it was behind in this way and also in terms of Oh, if you look at the attempts at color motion pictures of the Nazis, ugh, this stuff is really crappy compared to what had come out in the United States. And again, in another, I could give you really striking examples of this. So again, I, I don't remember ex exactly how I sort of started with this uh, um, um, with this particular. Train, but you see, I'm interested in the not just Jews working as photographers, but Jews working within, say, photography in other respects as well, which I think is part of the story of Jews at the turn of the century in the interwar years. It relates to show business, commercialism, high and low culture, and the kinds of things they did, to put it in a very crass sense, to kind of make a buck. Thank you. Um, I wanted to follow up. Uh, we were speaking over dinner about this film, Photo Amateur. So for people that don't know, uh, it's a documentary I often show about um, Holocaust, um, the filming, or I mean, color slides that were found uh, that were taken by Walter Genevein, who is chief accountant in Woods Ghetto. And it's a very interesting documentary that relies largely on these slides, which are color. And a lot of the voiceover, I was explaining the voiceover is uh, actual uh, transcripts from the actors themselves and from Genevine, he keeps writing to Agfa. 
why is the color so bad? He's <laughs> he's angry, and so it's really interesting that it, it follows exactly um, what you've said. Uh, so my personal like little bit of knowledge about Holocaust um, uh, photography, color photography at, at the time, definitely uh, fits very well with that. And he's yeah, he's so why is it brown? What's going on? Why why can't you fix this? Right? And he's very angry with the Agfa people that. He's trying to take these photos, oh, and, and, and he's Adolf doing a Hitler bad job. Adolf Hitler himself was extremely angry. That <laughs> is that that he just felt that it did not even come close to matching stuff that he actually knew fairly fairly well. And also, as he styled himself as an artist, uh, um, and I'm gonna say, in some ways, one of the few things that we have that keep us going is it's great when Hitler is driven crazy, you know, <laughs> or, or really frustrated, or really angry with other with other Nazis. So uh, <laughs> this is one of the things that, that really did upset him tremendously. That's interesting. And th so then I have a question which is totally unrelated to that, but again, from my non-expert knowledge of Holocaust um, photography, but one of the most famous examples is the um, example in the Holocaust Museum of the Tower of Faces, um, the Yafe Eliach with the um, Eshishak uh, photograph. So I was just wondering, what you can say I about that. I almost don't want it. I want okay. to say very little, but because <laughs> I think that um, there was not much of an effort to actually talk about where those photographs came from. And her own family, you know, was in the photography business, mm -hmm. but I think she, I'll be as delicate as, I think she accumulated other photographs from other, what had been Jewish photography studios and I would say I found it very frustrating trying to deal with um, the material from that collection. It's to say it was not terribly well documented. From the Holocaust Museum? Yeah. Like in the archives there? Yeah, so I've got to say said very little, very little about it. Okay, all right, thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.